Senator Kennedy has been shot. Is that possible? Is that possible? It's good. Is it possible, ladies and gentlemen? It is possible. He has. Not only Senator Kennedy. Oh, my God. Senator Kennedy has been shot. And another man, a Kennedy campaign manager, and possibly shot in the head. Welcome to the latest Psycho Killer, shocking true crime podcast. I'm Jack Morell, a former British major crime detective, and I'm joined by my friends from the world of journalism, Pip Watts. Hello. And Simon Ford. Hello. In this podcast, we're going to explore assassinations in Britain and America, a transatlantic comparison of how the UK and the US deal with the politically motivated murders of public figures. What's prompted this? Well, the New York Times, among others, recently reported the California Board of Parole's decision to release a man who'd spent 50 years in prison. But, and here's the crux of the story, the decision was overruled by Gavin Newsom, the governor of California. Who is this mystery prisoner, I hear you ask? Well, Sirhan Sirhan, in full Sirhan Bishara Sirhan, was a Palestinian-born Jordanian citizen who was convicted in 1969 of assassinating Robert F. Kennedy the previous summer. Robert Kennedy was a United States senator, a former U.S. attorney general, and of course the brother of the most renowned assassination victim of modern times, President John F. Kennedy, who was shot in Dallas, Texas on the 22nd of November 1963. Sirhan shot to death Robert Kennedy at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, California on the 5th of June 1968. The New York senator, who was the Democrat candidate in the 1968 presidential election, died the next day. Sirhan Sirhan received the death penalty, but the sentence was later commuted to life. Hence, 54 years after Senator Kennedy's assassination, the outrage surrounding the killer's proposed release from custody. Terrorism, as I understood it in my police service, meant the use of violence for political ends. That bit was pretty straightforward, as was the legislation. In Britain, the Prevention of Terrorism Act of 1984 had some useful offences not found in other criminal legislation, such as belonging to a prescribed organisation and also failing to disclose information which might prevent an act of terrorism or help convict a terrorist. Sure. Now, as journalists, Pip and I are familiar with the list of prescribed, or to put it another way, banned organisations in the UK. I believe, too, that generally speaking, there's no legal requirement for British citizens to assist the police. Although, of course, obstructing them is another matter. But assisting them, I believe that's a moral duty. However, when it comes to terrorism... If I suspect someone is preparing an act of terrorism, it is an offence for me not to tell the police. Am I right? And here I go, Jack. Sorry, this isn't very fair on you, is it? I'm lumping two questions together. If so, what sentence would that offence carry? Five years in prison. And you're right, Simon. Although it has to be information that you know or believe might be of material assistance. Now, we should clarify that this UK legislation related to Northern Irish terrorism. But we started with Sahan Sahan and the assassination of Robert Kennedy in the United States. Was Sahan Sahan a member of a terrorist organisation? One that could have been banned by the US authorities and pursued by the FBI? Or did he act alone? You know, was he a lone wolf? We'll come on to that shortly, but I'm glad you mentioned Ireland because historically much of the UK's anti-terrorism legislation stemmed from Ireland's struggle for independence and later on the troubles in Northern Ireland. The two-party system was the foundation of parliamentary democracy as we know it today in Britain, but being a politician in those early years was a risky business. A number of politicians 
paid with their lives. We have to go back more than 200 years to the first recorded murder of a Member of Parliament in the UK. In 1812, the Tory Prime Minister, Spencer Percival, was shot dead in the lobby of the House of Commons. The murder was over a debt, and Percival is the only serving Prime Minister of the United Kingdom to have been assassinated. And he was murdered within the beating heart of British democracy, in the Palace of Westminster. 1882, the first assassination associated with the Irish question. Lord Frederick Cavendish was a Liberal and a new Chief Secretary for Ireland. He'd arrived in Dublin and was walking in the Phoenix Park, from the Chief Secretary's Lodge to the Vice Regal Lodge, with T.H. Burke, the Under Secretary for Ireland. Both were stabbed to death by a man called James Carey and others all members of the Irish National Invincibles. 1922. Sir Henry Wilson was an Ulster Unionist for North Down, just a year after the province of Northern Ireland was established. The former distinguished British Army Field Marshal and Chief of the Imperial General Staff during World War I was shot outside his home in Eaton Square, London. The killers were Reginald Dunn and Joseph O'Sullivan, members of the Irish Republican Army. We then have to wait more than 50 years for the next assassination. Then Britain was hit by four in the space of 10 years. We were working away and there was a sudden bang and I looked up and Chris said, uh, I think that was a bomb. And I said, oh, I don't think so. It was probably a car backfiring. Well, it was a car, but it wasn't backfiring. Chris pulled the curtains too rapidly. I said, don't go near the curtains, it is a bomb. 1979, Airy Neve, a Conservative who was the Shadow Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. His car was blown up by a bomb on the ramp of the House of Commons car park. The murderers were never identified, although the Irish National Liberation Army claimed responsibility. 1981, Reverend Robert Bradford, an Ulster Unionist MP for Belfast South shot dead at a constituent surgery in Belfast. Sir Anthony Berry, Conservative MP for Enfield Southgate, killed in the bombing of the Grand Hotel Brighton during the Conservative Party conference. Patrick McGee of the Provisional IRA was convicted. 1990. Ian Gow, MP for Eastbourne, killed by a car bomb near his home in East Sussex. This was the last of the assassinations relating to the Troubles in Northern Ireland, and the UK went more than 25 years before the next politically motivated murder. 2016. Joe Cox, MP for Batley and Spen, shot and stabbed before a constituent surgery in Burstall, West Yorkshire, by neo-Nazi and white supremacist Thomas Mayer. And most recently, in 2021... Sir David Amos, MP for South End West, who was stabbed at a constituency event. His killing is under investigation. Well, I distinctly remember the murder of Airy Neve in 1979. The main reason was I saw the news reports on the TV in France, where I was staying with a family on the school French exchange. Obviously, the newsreader came across as a babble to me, but Mrs. Vallard, my host, helped me understand by gesturing and shouting words that I could understand. Yeah, to be fair, until we did some research, I thought that Airy Neve's killers had been caught. I assumed also that they had probably been released, especially with the Anglo-Irish Agreement. Sure, in fact, only one of those four more recent murders by Irish nationalists was cleared up. That was the Brighton bomber, Patrick McGee. Yes, indeed. He was an interesting example of an assassin hiding in plain sight. Raised in England, he had an English accent. A useful addition to his CV when applying for the job of bomber with the IRA. That's right. He was born in Belfast and moved with his family to Norwich when he was two years old. Then he returned to Belfast at the age of 18 in 1969, where he soon joined the Provisional IRA. 
McGee was interned without trial at Long Kesh Prison for two years between 1973 and 1975. Whatever McGee and others like him had been up to, the government's decision to intern suspects without trial has since been acknowledged as a grave error and an affront to their human rights. It also inspired another generation of young people to join the fight for a united island. With plenty of volunteers signing up, and with those in custody going on hunger strike, because Westminster refused to treat them as political prisoners, they wanted revenge. They wanted to strike at the heart of government. They were planning the most audacious of assassinations. The target was Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and her cabinet. They were all staying at the Grand Hotel in Brighton for the 1984 Tory party conference. Four weeks before the bomb went off, McGee, complete with his English accent, stayed in the hotel under the name Roy Walsh. He planted the bomb with a long-delay timer in the bathroom. The bomb exploded at 2.54am on the 12th of October, killing five people and injuring 34. In a split second, the IRA have achieved their most daring strike on the British mainland. Everywhere there is confusion, panic, appalling suffering. One minute asleep, the next blown out of their beds. Most who've escaped are much too shocked to know what's happened. McGee was arrested in Glasgow, Scotland, eight months later. At his trial in 1986, he received eight life sentences and a minimum tariff of 35 years. The judge branded him a man of exceptional cruelty and inhumanity. Meanwhile, though, a political solution to the Irish question was gathering pace. In 1999, under what is known as the Good Friday Agreement, McGee was released from prison. He'd served 14 years, less than half of his original minimum tariff. One thing about all this is that individuals can find forgiveness, compassion and contrition. If individuals can, surely governments can too? The British Home Secretary at the time, Jack Straw, opposed it, but the High Court overruled him. Whilst McGee has continued to defend his role in the bombing, he's expressed remorse for the loss of innocent lives. Jo Berry, the daughter of Sir Anthony Berry, one of those McGee murdered, met the Brighton bomber a year after his release in an effort at achieving reconciliation. They have met several dozen times since that date. A man named Harvey Thomas, who survived the bombing, also forgave McGee in 1998. Thomas has since developed a friendship with McGee, including having him as a guest in his own home. Thomas cited his Christian faith as the reason why he felt compelled to forgive. On the other hand, former MP Norman Tebbett, whose wife was paralysed in the Brighton bombing, has said he could only forgive McGee if he went to the police and provided them with the names of anyone else who was responsible for the bombing. He has argued that giving up violence is insufficient. I wonder what percentage of people in the UK know the names Airy Neve or Patrick McGee, especially those born after 1970. Well, it's funny you should say that, because I conducted a little experiment recently on Twitter. I posted a picture of Patrick McGee along with his name. I asked people to answer honestly whether they knew what McGee is known for. Bearing in mind he tried to kill the UK Prime Minister, albeit 38 years ago, what percentage of people knew who he was? It was around 20%, one in five. That's interesting, Jack. I guess most of your followers are in the, what, over 30 demographic and have a reasonably broad understanding of history and politics too. Maybe, you know, people do forget. Anyhow, it's time to don our seven league boots and leap back to the other side of the Atlantic. Sihan Sihan. The name itself stands out, doesn't it? But has the assassination of Robert Kennedy been overshadowed by that of his brother John in 1963? 
Overshadowed is possibly the wrong term. Maybe the controversy over JFK and the numerous books and films about it has, dare I say, glamorised a cowardly act of violence. Sure. I mean, Lee Harvey Oswald is a name etched into our subconscious, isn't it? The man who killed John Kennedy. So what about Sirhan Sirhan? Does he deserve any forgiveness? Should he be released? Is America less forgiving than the UK? The New York Times reported, Governor Gavin Newsom of California denied parole to Sirhan B. Sirhan, departing from the recommendation of a state parole panel in August, that the man convicted of assassinating Robert F. Kennedy be freed. Mr. Sirhan's assassination of Senator Kennedy is among the most notorious crimes in American history, the governor wrote in his decision, saying he'd weighed the recommendation, but determined that Mr. Sirhan, 77, who spent more than 50 years in prison, still poses an unreasonable threat to public safety. After decades in prison, he has failed to address the deficiencies that led him to assassinate Senator Kennedy, the governor wrote. Mr. Sirhan lacks the insight that would prevent him from making the same types of dangerous decisions he made in the past. After the announcement, Mr. Kennedy's widow, Ethel Kennedy, and six of his nine surviving children said in a statement they were grateful and deeply relieved. Governor Newsom also noted that most of the Kennedy heirs opposed Mr. Sirhan's release. The governor has also repeatedly expressed his admiration for Mr. Kennedy and noted at a news conference in September that the first photograph, the only photograph you will see in my office is a photo of my father and Bobby Kennedy, just days before Bobby Kennedy was murdered. So what we have here then is a politician with a strong family connection to the Kennedys who overrules the lawyers on the parole board. You mentioned that most of the Kennedy family opposed Sahan's release. So who in the Kennedy family was more forgiving? The New York Times continues, One son, Douglas Kennedy, who is a correspondent for Fox News, said he felt compassion for Mr. Sirhan. Another son, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., pointed to Mr. Sirhan's impressive record of rehabilitation. That view wasn't helped, though, by the fact that Robert Kennedy Jr. is also, to quote the Times, a prominent promoter of vaccine misinformation. Not only that, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has also said he thinks Mr. Sirhan is innocent. Well, there's nothing like a good old-fashioned conspiracy story, is there? In a 2018 interview with the Washington Post, Robert Kennedy Jr. said that he'd visited Sir Hahn in prison and after a relatively lengthy conversation, the details of which he would not disclose, believed that Sir Hahn did not kill his father and that a second gunman was involved. OK, let's not get bogged down with the personal views of the Kennedy family. At the end of the day, six of the nine surviving children signed a statement urging the governor not to release the person who, and I quote, took our father from our family and from America. Angela Berry, a lawyer for Mr Sirhan, said in a statement that she planned to challenge the governor's decision. Not an iota of evidence exists to suggest Mr Sirhan is still a danger to society, she said. The hearing was reminded that Mr Sirhan had confessed to the crime – in 1989, he said in a television interview by the broadcaster David Frost, my only connection with Robert Kennedy was his sole support of Israel and his deliberate attempt to send those 50 bombers to Israel to obviously do harm to the Palestinians. Since then, however, he has said he does not remember committing the crime. At the hearing, Mr Sirhan said he must have brought the gun to the scene but could not recall much about the shooting. His lawyer also told the hearing that the 76-year-old was being treated for a heart condition and prostate cancer. It was also reported that one of the two parole commissioners said that Mr Sirhan had improved himself by taking classes in prison. So what was so special about Sirhan's crime? 
that makes him an unreasonable threat to public safety. Sahan Bishara Sahan was born in 1944 to an Arab Christian family in Jerusalem. This was in the Musrara district of Mandatory Palestine. He attended a Lutheran school and became a Jordanian citizen following the Jordanian annexation of the West Bank. According to his mother, as a child, Sirhan was traumatised by the violence he witnessed in the Arab-Israeli conflict, including the death of his older brother, who was run over by a military vehicle that was swerving to evade gunfire. When Sirhan was 12 years old, his family moved to the United States, initially to New York and then to California. In Altadena, he attended Elliott Junior High School, followed by John Muir High School and Pasadena City College, both in Pasadena. Sahan's father was described as a stern man who often beat his sons harshly. Shortly after the family's move to California, Bishara returned alone to the Middle East. The young Sahan was only 5 feet 5 inches tall and weighed under 10 stone. That's 120 pounds. At the age of 20, he moved to Corona to train to be a jockey but this career never materialised after he suffered a head injury in a racing accident. Sahan never became an American citizen, retaining instead his Jordanian citizenship. As a Christian in the Middle East, he'd been in the minority, but as an adult in the United States, well, the options were plentiful. He changed church denominations several times, joining Baptist and Seventh-day Adventist churches, In 1966, he joined the ancient mystical order of the Rose Cross, commonly known as the Rosicrucians. Shortly after midnight on the 5th of June, 1968, armed with a 22 calibre Ivor Johnson cadet revolver, Sahan approached Senator Robert Kennedy as he emerged with his entourage at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. Oh, my God. Senator Kennedy has been shot. And another man a Kennedy campaign manager, and possibly shot in the head. I am right here. Rafer Johnson has a hold of a man who apparently has fired the shot. That's it, Rafer. Get it. Get the gun, Rafer. Okay, now hold on to the guy. Hold on to him. Hold on to him, ladies and gentlemen. Hold him. Hold him. We don't want another Oswald. Sahan got off at least three shots before being overpowered. Kennedy was shot three times, once in the head and twice in the back. He died about 26 hours later at the Good Samaritan Hospital. Five other people at the event were also wounded, but all five recovered. They were Paul Schrader, a union official, William Weissel, a TV unit manager, Ira Goldstein, a reporter, Elizabeth Evans, a friend of Pierre Salinger, one of Kennedy's campaign aides, and Erwin Stroll, a young volunteer, an intern, helping Senator Kennedy. Let's take a look at the prosecution of Sahan Sahan. Now, political assassinations are high-profile incidents, and the courts need to get it right. Despite the fact that Sahan admitted his guilt in a recorded confession four days after the shooting, a lengthy and publicised trial followed. In the case of the people of the state of California versus Sahan Sahan, the judge did not accept his confession and refused to allow a change of plea to guilty. Was there pressure on the judge to have a full trial so that the public and media could have the case revealed in detail? At the start of the trial in February 1969, Sahan's lawyers made a motion in chambers to enter a plea of guilty to first-degree murder in exchange for life imprisonment rather than the death penalty. Sahan told Judge Herbert V. Walker that he wanted to withdraw his original plea of not guilty in order to plead guilty as charged on all counts. Sirhan also asked that his counsel disassociate themselves from this case completely. The judge asked him what he wanted to do about sentencing, and Sirhan replied, I will ask to be executed. Judge Walker denied the motion and said, This court will not accept the plea. 
He also denied Sir Han's request for his counsel to withdraw. His counsel entered another motion to withdraw from the case of their own volition. But Walker denied that as well. It seems that the judge was determined that justice would be seen to be done, and neither Sir Han nor his defence counsel were going to hijack that. Plus, Sir Han himself is not accepting the defence claim that he was mentally ill. He's trying to accept full responsibility, not only for his actions, but also the court process. The trial proceeded. The court heard about Sir Han's preparations to kill Senator Kennedy how he was seen at the Ambassador Hotel on the 3rd of June, two nights before the attack, to learn the building's layout, and that he visited a gun range on the 4th of June. Alvin Clark, Sir Han's garbage collector, testified that Sir Han had told him a month before the attack of his intention to shoot Kennedy. Now, if that's not withholding information about a planned act of terrorism, then I don't know what is. I guess he had more value as a prosecution witness, though, eh? Well, federal law's different, isn't it? Sahan's beleaguered defence counsel went through the motions of their case that the killing had been the impulsive act of a man with a mental deficiency. The trial judge, though, had admitted into evidence pages from three of the journals, the notebooks that Sahan had kept, that suggested the crime was premeditated and quite calculating and willful. Sahan gave evidence at court. When asked if he'd shot Kennedy, he replied, Yes, sir, but then said that he didn't bear Kennedy any ill will. Sahan also testified that he'd killed Kennedy with, quote, 20 years of malice aforethought. In an interview with David Frost in 1989, Sahan explained that the 20 years of malice aforethought referred to the time since the creation of the State of Israel. He's maintained since then that he has no memory of the crime, nor of making that statement in court. The defence based its case primarily on the expert testimony of Bernard L. Diamond, a professor of law and psychiatry, who testified that Sirhan was suffering from diminished capacity at the time of the murder. Unsurprisingly, after an eight-week trial, Sir Han was convicted of murder and was sentenced to death in the gas chamber. Ironically, this had been Sir Han's personal wish when he offered to plead guilty. Three years later, California abolished the death penalty. His sentence was commuted to life in prison. It seems that the whole case and the notoriety of it was far bigger and more important than the insignificant little man in the dock. What on earth prompted this man to commit such an act of terrorism? To assassinate one particular politician over the foreign policy decisions of the country where he resided. To seemingly have acted alone and without any encouragement or indoctrination. This is not like Patrick McGee drawn into the excitement of the Irish Republican Army in its war against the British. This was surely the actions of a lonely and confused man, probably depressed, who obsesses about the wrongs of the world and needs to take his anger and frustration out on someone. After his arrest, Sirhan said, I can explain it. I did it for my country. Sirhan believed that he was deliberately betrayed by Kennedy's support for Israel in the June 1967 Six-Day War, which had begun one year to the day before the assassination. During a search of Sir Han's apartment, a spiral-bound notebook was found containing a diary entry showing his anger was fixated on Kennedy, who had promised to send 50 fighter jets to Israel if he was elected president. Sir Han's journal entry of May the 18th, 1968, read... My determination to eliminate RFK is becoming the more and more of an unshakable obsession. Kennedy must die before June the 5th. You don't get much better than that, do you? A handwritten note and a conversation with your bin man explaining what you plan to do. Quite. They found other notebooks and diary entries expressing his growing rage at Kennedy. 
His journals also contained many aphorisms that were thought to be his version of free writing. He wrote in support of communism, long live communism, I firmly support the communist cause and its people. American capitalism will fall and give way to the workers' dictatorship. The political aspect of the case got the media scrutinising it in a rational way, something that Sahan certainly never did. Depending on which side of the argument you stood, the case was being made more political than it actually was. The Los Angeles Times printed an article by Jerry Cohen that made it quite clear his view on the motive for the assassination. The article stated, When the Jordanian nationalist, Sahan Bishara Sahan, allegedly shot Kennedy, ostensibly because of the senator's advocacy of the US support for Israel, the crime with which he was charged was in essence another manifestation of the centuries-old hatred between Arab and Jew. M.T. Mehdi was the Secretary General of the Action Committee on American-Arab Relations. In contrast, he believed Sahan had acted in justifiable self-defence, stating, Sahan was defending himself against those 50 phantom jets Kennedy was sending to Israel. Mehdi wrote a hundred-page book on the subject called Kennedy and Sirhan, Why? Sirhan later claimed that he was drunk at the time. An interview with Sirhan in 1980 revealed new claims that a combination of liquor and anger over the anniversary of the 1967 Arab-Israeli war had triggered his actions. You must remember the circumstances of that night, the 5th of June. That was when I was provoked, Sirhan said recorded in a transcript of one of his interviews with Mehdi. That is when I initially went to observe the Jewish Zionist parade in celebration of the 5th of June 1967, the victory over the Arabs. That was the catalyst that triggered me on that night. Then Sir Han said, in addition there was the consumption of liquor, and I want the public to understand that. Let's put the opinions of psychiatrists and experts on the conflict in the Middle East aside for a moment. This was a confused, mixed-up young man. A man who was in a new country. The country that he blamed for fueling a conflict that had ruined his childhood. A conflict that had left him traumatised, we might say, with PTSD. A man who, as a child, had been exposed to grief and probably abuse too. A man exposed to religious conflict and distrust, but who was neither Arab nor Jew. So, what about parole? California parole law is ever-changing. When a new law goes into effect, it doesn't usually affect those who are convicted under a previous statute. Rather, it applies prospectively to future inmates. When you are convicted is an important consideration in understanding your minimum eligible parole date. For example, some laws specifically state that they only apply to prisoners who were convicted or incarcerated before 1983, and some only to prisoners who were incarcerated or convicted after 1977. For the most part, California has a mandatory parole system. Eligible parolees are supposed to be paroled unless they present an overriding public safety risk. What constitutes an overriding public safety risk is very discretionary and very open to interpretation. Prior to 1977, that wasn't the case. Now, if that system seems complicated and open to political interpretation, then spare a thought for those involved in the early release of prisoners convicted of crimes during the sectarian conflict in Northern Ireland, people like Patrick McGee. The Sentence Review Commission of 1998 was responsible for regulating the early release of certain prisoners convicted during the Troubles. It allowed for up to 500 Loyalist and Republican prisoners to be released. The scheme to release prisoners as part of the peace process provoked moral outrage, especially within the unionist community. It was seen, though, as necessary to appease the paramilitary organisations, namely the Provisional IRA, the Irish Nationalists, and also the pro-British Ulster Volunteer Force and Ulster Defence Association. 
To be eligible for early release, the prisoner had to be affiliated to a paramilitary organization that had established and maintained, I quote, a complete and unequivocal ceasefire. The Commission decided which prisoners should be released early and whether any were a threat to society and could reoffend. Each prisoner was released on a license that could be revoked if the person rejoined a paramilitary organization or supported paramilitary activity. It was like a mass parole board, wiping the slate clean. When the day came, on the 28th of July 2000, the Guardian newspaper summed it up perfectly. The Mays prison was almost empty tonight. Just 15 inmates were left inside the 800 cells. By the end of the year, most will have been released or transferred elsewhere, and the top security prison finally shut down. The H blocks emptied in just three hours today as the government freed the last big batch of 78 prisoners under the early release terms of the Good Friday Agreement. 428 terrorists, 143 of them serving life sentences, were released. Mass killers and bombers responsible for the worst atrocities during 30 years of violence walked free. The IRA men, UDA and UFF men, men from the UVF, LVF and INLA, they all walked. The prison service made sure the releases were phased and that Republicans and loyalists didn't bump into each other in the car parks of the high-security prison. Indeed, they ensured rival loyalists were kept well apart from each other. All that was over 20 years ago, so we have a generation of adults who don't hear much about the troubles in Northern Ireland. If they are well and truly over, they were helped in part by that politically risky parole board that let all those violent criminals out. Forgiveness and reconciliation. Politics and public opinion. Crime and punishment. The law and morality on a collision course. Encapsulated in cases like those of the IRA prisoners in Northern Ireland and Sirhan Sirhan. Should he ever be let out? Well, I imagine that if he was, there wouldn't be such a fanfare as we saw in Northern Ireland just an old man walking into the Californian sunshine whose moment of madness came and went in a flash, his name an echo of the politics and paranoia of the 1960s. So, what is it about these two characters, Sirhan Sirhan and Patrick McGee, were they psychopaths? Well, we haven't spoken to them and not really had time to understand their personalities, But I don't think either of them will pass the threshold. Both young men who believed their cause was justified. Sir Han was mixed up emotionally and has even shown some empathy and remorse. McGee? Well, I wouldn't be surprised if he returned from his English school days to Northern Ireland as an angry young misfit who wanted to be accepted. He joined the Provos, the biggest gang there was, and he went on an exciting adventure believing it was justified. My instinct is to see the different sides of their stories. Can we explain idealism and patriotism in terms of a psychological condition? To even try, I think, without applying rigorous scientific method, it's foolish. I'll leave that to the armchair psychologists on Twitter. But if somebody published a doctoral thesis on the subject, one that was peer-reviewed, I'd love to study it, because the more we can understand the workings of the human mind, I think, the better. That's my two cents. Thanks for listening to Psycho Killer. Visit our website, psycho-killer.co, for exclusive content. And you can support us at Buy Me A Coffee, where... We're psychopals. That's all one word, psychopals. Yes, please, we need your support to help us research the cases you love to listen to. We'll see you again soon on the dark side for another psycho killer, shocking true crime story. <laughs>